So this week, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Andrea Damascelli, who is one of our own faculty members. And he's also the director of the Stuart Blusson Quantum Matter Institute. Uh, I know that some fraction of our department spend a lot of time further along East Mall than the Hennings building. And for the rest of us, it's a sort of mysterious other place that people hang out. We don't really quite know what goes on there. So I asked Andrea to give us a sort of overview uh, just sort of aimed at the people who are not experts, but I assume the experts will still be interested. But um, but he uh, agreed to do that today, so it's great to hear more about the Stuart Blusson Quantum Matter Institute. Uh, it's all yours, Andrea. So thanks, uh, Douglas. Thanks for the invitation. It's really you know, a pleasure to be here and telling you about our institute. Um, somehow the you know the distance uh, is always a problem. So having been in a new building far you know down the down East Mall is, is is a bit of a separation, too much of a separation. So it's really a pleasure to be there here today, so I can tell you more about this. <clears throat> the idea is um, you see there is the title quantum material by design. So it is to give you an overview of what the Institute does around this concept. And uh, it's a little bit of, uh, yeah, an overview of the people, an overview of uh, the different research projects, and also a bit of an historical overview as a connection between science and, uh, you know, uh, and, and the development of this Institute over the years. Let me also mention that in addition to the, the Institute itself, in, uh, in, uh, on, on UBC campus, we also house the Max Planck UBC U Tokyo Center for Quantum Materials, which is basically an international Max Planck Center <clears throat> devoted to the study of materials. Let me start from this beautiful image. It's a recent work. This is basically the, you know, the image of, uh, of uh, the radial uh, wave function you know, with a nodal structure. It's obtained by a technique which is, uh, you know, it's a microscopy technique. It's basically photo-induced, uh, uh, photoionization microscopy. And uh, what, what this is was done, was done by, the way it was done, was done by uh, ion, creating a, a beam of, uh, of hydrogen atoms and placing them in a field, a DC field that breaks the symmetry, and then basically uh, populating with laser fields a specific level, you know, high energy rebuild states in the system. And then through an interference project, a process do <clears throat> an imaging of the of the wave function directly. We, basically, there is no reconstruction and you know, a posterior reconstruction is direct imaging. And the beauty of this is it shows what you already know. It shows basically the orbital structure of, of this electronic wave function, and which of course is connected to their quantum nature. But even such a simple experiment becomes really complex. Instead, if, if instead of looking at a single electron atom, you start looking at, you know, multiple electrons in the atom. And so how you deal with electron-electron interaction is really the challenge. And in fact, we, you know, that's what I will be discussing. And you know, the, the dream would be not just to be imaging the wave function of a single electron, but to be imaging the wave function of a many body electron system simultaneously. And why is that? Well, if you now look at solids, you know, the challenge that we're facing is you're not describing a single electron. We are describing actually 10 to the 23 electrons. And that is really where the quantum mechanical properties emerge from. And, and what we try to do in, in the research at QMI is really to take advantage of those 10 to the 23 electrons, those many body states, to exploit novel physical properties. And what do you need an institute? Well, uh, the institute is, becomes necessary because in a field like this one, you will read, and as, as I will outline and explain, we try to go from fundamental to applications, so uh, you really try to bring in physics, the understanding of materials, the making of the materials, so chemistry, all the way to the electrical engineer. So here uh, are the three, uh, you know, in overarching uh, themes uh, that you find in the institute, and this is represented by the large number of people that were uh, then, you know, brought in into the institute. In a way, this is similar to what you see in other large uh, uh, operations like NASA or, or LIGO. Uh, or you know particle physics at CERN, so bringing in all, all of those uh, people with with the complementary expertise to to tackle these grand grand problems. So, in particular, you know if you look at faculty members, we have 25 faculty members. There is one new to come uh, with the competition we have opened this year, and you're going to see that you know 
you, you know all of these faces or most of these faces. Physics is by, by far the, the largest representation. In addition to that, we have chemistry, electrical engineering. I have uh, taken the liberty for some of the people who have joined appointment like Sarah Burke and George Savatsky to, you know, uh, place them under physics today. But of course, this, this shows through the participation of different departments, through joint positions in different departments, the, you know, the uh, sort of uh, uh, intertwined nature of the work that we do between different fields. Now, QMI has been there since 2010 as an institute with uh, George as the founding director of the institute. And uh, a key step has been the Canada First Research Excellence Fund competition, which brought in a number of, uh, you know, um, a large amount of funding uh, for the following seven years under one specific program, which was entitled here. You can see quantum materials and future technology. So the idea really at that time was to go from the very fundamental work in materials all the way to uh, technologies and translation and, 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 uh, and, and that kind of the aspect. So we have more applied. And so in order to do that, uh, we have brought in, in this under the same roof and effectively under the same building, experts in quantum materials, quantum matter, theory modeling, experimentation, characterization, all the way to devices. And so the vision of the institute under the, under the CFREF project is really to become a leading institute in quantum materials and also in quantum devices. And not only work on the fundamental research, but also uh, facilitate the nucleation of an ecosystem around Vancouver, BC, and Canada in this particular field. What I'd like to do next so, is to really look at you know, this concept of quantum materials by design and do it through the, the, the story of high temperature superconductivity here at UBC. So superconductivity, high temperature, starts in uh, at the end of the 80s, so 1986, 1987. That's when the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded to Benzer and Muller for the discovery of superconductivity, high temperature in the copper oxide materials. And what is really interesting, well, here you see the cover of Time magazine, which at that time, you know, highlighted the discovery really as, you know, the uh, beginning of a revolution. Uh, you know, thanks to the, the, the property of material of, con of, of conducting electricity by dissipation. From a UBC perspective, what is really interesting is the fact that, you know, uh, we had three people at that time, Walter Hardy, Doug Bonner, and Rishin Liang, who got interested in this project and set up to, to, to perform a very delicate experiment to look at the nature of superconductivity in these materials. And they require very pure and clean materials. You see here the, the crystals that they've grown in, in their lab. And so immediately, uh, you know, this group came together right after the discovery and started working on this in, um, in well, actually in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Hennings first and then in the Ample building. Eventually, their work led to this uh, seminal paper, uh, really led by the three of them and some students. And this paper really looked at the symmetry of a superconducting gap. So in a, in a metal, you have electrons which are driving uh, under the application of a voltage or current through, through material. Uh, in a superconductor, uh, the, the electrons, the free electrons, are now paired up in what are called Cooper pairs. So these are now a many body object uh, with some pairing between the two particles that compose the Cooper pair. If uh, you look at a more conventional superconductor, like a, a well, it's, it's called a BCS, a bardeen cooper schrieffer system, uh, this pairing is isotropic in space, which basically means, you know, you could describe it similar to the S wave of, a, of, a, of an electron in, a, in, a, in an atom. So no particular symmetry breaking, and the gap or the pairing strength is the same whichever direction you look at. If you now look at uh, these systems, it turns out that the, the symmetry of that pairing is a D wave. And I'm illustrating that here uh, using, in fact, the QMI logo, which really was based on that discovery and that idea. So you have basically uh, a, an order parameter that describes the superconductor. The order parameter has a phase. Here is the sign, positive and negative phases. And along some directions, so this particular direction, there is actually a node in the gap structure. So the gap is not the same value everywhere in space, but in some places the gap goes to zero. And to, to probe this, 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 this symmetry, and this is really uh, what Walter uh, Dagger and Shin have done, was to detect the presence of these nodes, they needed very clean samples. 
The reason being that the experiment is, ba is based on the penetration of, of microwave radiation in, in the solid, in the superconductor, and how this is being shielded. And so they were measuring a change in the what is called the London penetration depth as a function of temperature. If the system has a nest wave gap, is isotropic, that change, uh, that behavior is sort of exponential, reflecting the presence of a full gap. If nodes are present, so the gap goes to zero someplace, uh, you should see a linear signal. And that's what you see here. As a function of temperature, you see this change in the microwave penetration, which is perfectly linear, down to very low temperatures. However, if you have impurities, the behavior then can be strongly affected, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. And so that's where the drive for the very clean samples came from. Now, this was a beautiful experiment, really the very beginning of understanding high temperature superconductivity, and really put UBC on the map for work on superconductivity. So if you look at the body of work that uh, you know, Doug Walter and Rasheen generated over the years, it corresponds to more than 240 papers and more than 17,000 citations, all on that field. Now, um, this, what you're seeing here is the phase diagram of the high temperature superconductor, in particular, yttrium barium copper oxide, which is a material grown by Doug Machine and Walter. You see doping on the one axis and on the other axis, temperature. And here is your superconducting dough. What is remarkable here is that not only your superconductivity shows up at very high temperature for some value of doping called the optimal doping, but it's also the proximity between this phase to a phase which one would usually consider totally. Uh, you know, um, opposite uh, and not favoring superconductivity at all. The material which is an insulator and in fact an antiferromagnetic insulator. So magnetism and insulating behavior usually are detrimental to conventional superconductivity. In this case, they live next to each other. Now, there is also other properties which you see here are shown in blue and, and, and pink shadows of some anomaly in the normal state or some evolution of the normal state might be of interest as well as some anomaly in the shape of this dome, which we'll come back to. So in order to look at that, what we then did uh, with, uh, with you know, several members of the, of the Institute, started looking at the normal state electronic structure. And what does that mean? I showed the case of an atom, so a single atom with its own orbitals. You can go to a molecule, and now you form already a, 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 some sort of many body wave function into the molecule, all the way to the solid, where now you have a periodic lattice, and the electronic states develop into bands, allowed bands of energy states, and disallowed bands. Now, the interesting aspect is that in a solid, you have a new quantum number you take into account, which is the momentum, so the direction of motion of the particle in the solid. Another feature which is really relevant is the chemical potential. How many electrons do you have in your solid? And when you reach the you know, exhausting number of electrons, if you have a contour here that separates the occupied from the unoccupied states at an energy which is called the Fermi energy, that defines then the Fermi surface. That contour that encloses the occupied states is the Fermi surface. And it's a key property of the material because if, if there is a Fermi surface in the system, you can tell that the material is a metal. Otherwise, it's an insulator. And usually, conventionally, this Fermi surface should be a closed contour, as you should see there. So can you actually measure that? And yes, the answer is you can. You can measure it directly. There is a number of techniques to do that. The one that my group has developed over the years, and we use a lot here at UBC, is based on the photoelectric effect discovered by Einstein. The idea is that you come in with a, a photon. You excite electrons. Electrons are being then photoemitted in vacuum and collected by an electron analyzer, which will look at the energy, kinetic energy, and emission angles of those electrons. And the beauty of the technique is in its elegance. So basically using energy conservation relation and momentum conservation relation as pretty much uh, you know, uh, studied and, and postulated by Einstein, you can relate the kinetic energy of that electron to the binding energy in the solid, and you can determine what is the direction of motion and velocity inside the solid. <clears throat> By using this technique, you can also, of course, visualize the Fermi surface because you can see all of the occupied states of the system. And we did that on, uh, on uh, Walters and Doug and Rasheen samples. And here is on the what is called the overdog side. You can see it is nice and being yellow, the, the Fermi surfaces. This is only one symmetry unit of a crystal. Imagine these contours as being closed 
around these corners. Now, what was surprising was as you as you go down in doping across the optimal doping, this Fermi surface break down in segments, disconnected segments. These are called Fermi arcs, and that highlights you know uh, provides you a, a signature of the uh, unconventional many body nature of this system as you go across the optimal dope regime. So without going into the details of what this means, this is really a, a, an experimental information you need to use in developing a microscopic model for these systems. What I'd like to emphasize here, please have a look at this anomaly in the value of TC and its connection to the presence of this disconnected Fermi surface, which is very unconventional. And we'll come back to that later. Now, what I showed so far was all of the effort in the in the making the highest purity samples to make this study possible. The next step, of course, has been the development of the techniques, the infrastructure that we have used for the experiment I just showed, as well as other experiments. So a lot is going going on in the QMI in uh, the old and the new building. So in fact, you know, it would be great to uh, always host anyone who's inter interested in seeing this. But a lot a lot has also gone on at facilities around Canada. One is Triumph, where we have the new SR beam line. The other one is the Canadian light source. And there we have developed a technique, a, a beam line for photo emission, angle resolved photo emission, which is the technique I use, and as well one uh, for resonant elastic and inelastic X-ray scattering. This is a beam line that was developed by George Sapatsky. And in fact, you know, this is work that brings together many of us, including Bernard Keimer from Max Planck Stuttgart, as you know, an effort that bring, it is not only a Canadian effort, but also involved the Max Planck Society. And as part of that joint effort, George uh, and, and Bernard Keimer came up a few years ago with a very influential and important paper that basically reports the discovery in these materials of a spontaneous symmetry breaking of a valence charge. And let me tell you more about that. So this is something we have looked at together you know, over a number of, uh, of, of years with Doug and, uh, and, and Bernard Keimer and George and so on. And basically the point is, and this is work done on a slightly different cupre, is now not anymore yttrium barium copper oxide, but is a bismuth strontium lanthanum copper oxide. But the physics is the same. And the key observation here is that if you look at the crystal structure, you, fa you find a certain symmetry. But if you look at the valence electrons, they actually self-organize in a symmetry, in a pattern which is different. And this is what is called a charge density wave. that's sort of pictorially shown there. And so this spontaneous symmetry breaking is really, you know, believed to, to be playing a role in, in, in high temperature superconductivity. So where does that actually happen? Well, if you go back to the phase diagram, we have discussed the insulator, the superconductivity, the charge order happens to be there where you see a suppression in the value of superconductivity. And so the two phenomena seem to be competing, but at the same time, they are characterized by the same D-wave symmetry. So the pairing of charge in the CDW, in the charge density wave, or the pairing of charge in the superconducting state seem to be born out of the same symmetry breaking, a D-wave type symmetry. So that's really is intriguing and suggests that there could be, there should be a connection between the two phenomena. Now, uh, I'd like to, to move on. This is, you know, this is what happened in the past few years. What's the current situation? Well, superconductivity. So following again with the theme of superconductivity, here is a new twist. This is very recent and uh, has to do with graphene now. And while before I was showing a, a cover of, of Time magazine, here is now an article that appeared recently on, on the New York Times. And what you're seeing here is graphene, but it, which is you know, a single layer of carbon atoms in an hexagonal pattern. But it's actually not a single layer, it's two layers. And they are twisted, so rotated with respect to each other by an angle which is called the magic angle, which is 1.1 degree. And by doing this operation, you're taking a system like graphene, which is a good metal, it's atomically thin, but it's not a superconductor. And by do, doing that twist, you are actually engineering the band structure or changing the density of states of electrons in this system, and the system becomes now a superconductor. So basically, you're re-engineering the system to exhibit a property that the pristine material does not show. And this is really, you know, the, the concept behind uh, quantum materials by design. Now, what if instead of twisting two layers of graphene, so good metal, you were to twist two layers of the superconductors, the copper oxygen based superconductor I just shown. Here is a, you know, a pictorial representation. 
Well, this is actually an idea that came from uh, Marcel's group. So Marcel Franz and his student have worked on this. And so here is this very elegant concept. You take a copper oxide superconductor with its uh, D wave like gap. You take a second layer of that. Now you, you rotate, in this case, not by 1.1 degrees, but close to 45 degrees. You overlap them and then you switch on the coupling between the two. And if you do that, you start forming a different kind of state. It's a new state of matter. And in fact, is if you have that coupling, becomes a system which no longer is a simple D wave, dx squared minus y squared, which is what we had before, but it also has an additional component with an imaginary unit on top. So that is really interesting because now this system becomes a fully gap superconductor. You can see it here. There are two, you know, there are two uh, in color. You can see the resulting from the coupling. So the, the gap is now fully developed, even though it's not an S wave. It's fully developed and is also topological. So now this system becomes a topological superconductor. And the beauty of this is uh, because of that, it can sustain excitations, which are not a typical fermionic excitation. They're called Majorana edge modes. And Majorana is a particle, you know, we define it as a, a particle which is uh, identical to its own antiparticle. But the key thing here is that this particular exotic excitations are believed to be, uh, you know, playing a, a, a you know, a, a, you know, have a lot of promise in topological quantum computation. So the idea here is to go from a superconductor, high temperature, uh, engineer now a new system which is a topological superconductor. And because you've started from a high temperature superconductor, this will be a topological high temperature system. And so now you can do you know, quantum computation with Majorana modes at high temperature. That would be the dream. So is it possible? And uh, the answer is, well, at the level of taking these materials and making a single layer out of it, the answer is yes, it's possible. So here is the structure you see in red is the copper layers, the copper oxygen layers. In blue, you and so then you have in, in white the other atoms, you know, bismuth and strontium. Blue is the oxygen. So what this group is showing in China uh, was to be able to break the system here, where there is a bonding which is very weak. It's called van der Waals bonding. You can break it and isolate a single element like this one, which is called a, a, a bism, you know, a bismuth, a copper oxygen bilayer. And, uh, and so it was possible to extract a, sing a single layer like this, a single unit like that, and then compare the behavior of resistivity versus temperature. And what you see here, as you cool down the temperature, the system becomes a better and better metal and eventually becomes a superconductor and resistivity goes to zero. And what is remarkable is if you compare a single layer, so this particular unit, to a full uh, three-dimensional three crystal, they behave exactly the same, which really tells you that superconductivity is a property, the high temperature superconductivity, born out of a single copper oxygen layer. And here you see a microscopy image where you can see a single layer, a, a, a bilayer, and so on. Now, is it possible to take objects like this and twist them? Well, the answer again is yes. This is work that was done again in, uh, in, in the same paper, which is soon coming out in Nature Physics, where with uh, Ryan Day, uh, one of my students, and Ilya Elfimo, we looked also, at whether or not when you put these two layers rotated at 45 degrees, you can obtain a stable system. And this is shown here where you see total energy versus, uh, versus this, uh, this uh, um, uh, you know, versus the basically this for this structure versus the distance between the copper oxygen, the copper copper layers. And you find a minimum, which basically tells you that the system will be stable at a given distance. And in fact, that distance is very similar to what you find in the actual material. So the system can be made. Now, how do you make that? Well, this is where now Ziliang Yi comes in with his group. Uh, and uh, it actually is a rather complex process where you, know, you start off from a bulk crystal and you have to obtain these two sheets rotated at 45 degrees. And here is an image of what was obtained. So a bottom bismuth cuprate sample and a top bismuth cuprate sample uh, rotated at 45 degrees and obtained from the very same single crystal. But in a nutshell, that's how you do it. And uh, you start off with uh, two uh, different stages. On one, you have a silicon and silicon oxide substrate 
and then using scotch tape, which is the technique that was used initially for graphene to generate graphene from graphite, you start generating, you know, peeling off copper oxygen layer out of a superconductor. And then you can transfer them by sticking them onto the silicon oxide. You can do the same on a second stage where now you have a, a holder and on top of that a polymer and you can now stick uh, a, a single copper oxygen layer on that polymer. You can then flip it and put it on top of the other one and then using a rotation stage and a microscope you can align them so as to have a proper 45 degrees rotation and then you bring one close to the other and just the van der Waals uh, coupling is enough to take off that single layer and form the structure. So, uh, again, if we look at the, uh, I think, the, the concept of quantum materials they design and whether or not you need an institute, I think this particular project really highlights uh, the power of a situation like this one. You have Marcel with the concept, initial concepts, really the, the, the idea. Then you have uh, Ziliang, who's going to, is making the samples, and at the same time is using optical techniques uh, to, to look at whether or not, you know, you obtain a, a particular properties which uh, which is called time reversal symmetry breaking, which is you know expected for this kind of, of topological superconductor. In general, you have a number of people more doing uh, all kind using all kind of experimental tools to look at these samples. And finally, you also have uh, Josh Paul coming in and uh, and working on device fabrication. So it really can go from a proof of principle idea you know, all the way to devices. Now. If we think again in terms of the technique, the angle resolve for the mission technique I illustrated, uh, initially I, I show how you can use it to look at the electronic structure, you know, the basic electronic structure of a material. Uh, in the case of the project by Marcel, you would like to look at now if you have you know, a pairing for, for electrons forming a superconductor, you could study whether this pairing is isotropic or not whether there is a full gap everywhere, full pairing everywhere, or, or, or has nodes. And so you can really look at that. There is a new twist to this, uh, which is now to take this technique to the time domain. And this is where the work we've done together with uh, David Jones and his group comes in. And what you're seeing here is a project that was started about 10 years ago by David and, and, uh, and myself, uh, funded by CFI, has then evolved you know, to become a key uh, part in the Max Planck UBC Tokyo Center. It has also received funding from the Moore Foundation in the last few years. And in the last couple of years, uh, this system and this project started to work and produce a number of papers. And the idea was, what about instead of coming in with a single photon, removing an electron and doing a mapping of electronic structure, could you also come in with an additional photon and have one ultra-fast pulse of light exciting the sample and a second one probing the dynamics of the excited sample. And so that required development ultra-fast laser sources, be able to control the time delay between the two of them, and in particular, require the development of a laser source generating ultraviolet photos. Otherwise, I mean, basically, in other words, photons with an energy which is large enough to photomit an electron which you cannot do in the visible. And that's where David and Art Mills have worked for, for a year, and this has really been a heroic effort in developing this particular facility, which can do an experiment like that. Um, in a nutshell, and this is really, you know, it's, it's re this is really a very special uh, work that was done here, and is in fact is a unique system in the world. In a nutshell, the idea is to use a gas jet to generate uh, and con basically convert a, a low energy photon into a high energy photon. Basically, the, with the pulse you come in, you deform me the ionic potential of, of the gas, you almost remove an electron from the, from the, from the gas, the, the electron then is, is, is uh, being brought back into, uh, into the atom itself, and as it does that, generates a high energy photon. Usually this work is done in, in, uh, in a single pass through a gas jet, and requires very high uh, peak powers, which means very short pulses and very uh, low repetition rates for the, for the laser sources. What David and Art have been able to do was to put, place this gas in a cavity. It's a, it's a five meters long cavity with seven mirrors and be able to keep the cavity stable of the level of two nanometers over the five meters for hour so that this system can generate 
high energy photons that can be used for this experiment. What you see here is actually an image of all of the, the high harmonics which are generated and one which is being selected to go in your sample. So this has really been a monumental effort as far as uh, a source development and uh, the, one of the first studies we've used it for is uh, led by, by Katie, uh, now a student in our group, uh, and really has to do with looking at some of the most fundamental interaction in solid, which is electron photon coupling. And let me tell you just a few words about that. So why am I picking electron photon coupling here? Well, I've been talking about superconductivity, and while the mechanism behind the superconductivity in, uh, in cuprates is still uh, debated, uh, certainly electron photon coupling plays the, the key role in conventional superconductors like you know, lead and aluminum and so on. Can we measure it? Well, actually, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to, to get a, a precise quantitative measurement or you know, estimate of, of electron photon coupling. One way is to do calculations. So density functional theory allows you to calculate not only the electronic structure, but also the coupling of an electron which is propagating inside a solid to the, the vibration of the solid, so to the phone. There are also techniques like neutron scattering, and light scattering, and so on that can be used, but it's really difficult to come to a value which is specific for one single electron and one particular lattice vibration in the solid. And both of them will be characterized by a given symmetry. And so that's where the challenge is. So here is the experiment that we have uh, come up. The idea was, uh, it's here explained for the case of graphene, uh, where you have a dispersion relation, so basically a band structure, which is characterized by these cones, so-called Dirac cones, because they correspond to what we call massless quasi-particles, so massless electrons in the system. So in graphene, you have this, this very interesting linear dispersion, conic, it's two-dimensional, and uh, the electronic states are occupied all the way to the Dirac point. So in black, occupied electronic states, in gray, unoccupied electronic states. What we can do then is come in with a photon, 1.2 eV, and excite an electron from the occupied to the unoccupied side of the electronic structure. The electron will then relax, and it can relax two ways. One is through electron-electron scattering, but we are interested in what happens if the electron relaxes by interacting with the, with the photon, in particular emitting a photon. Well, in that case, you should expect the electron to lose energy, corresponding to the energy of the photon itself. And, and come down and approach the data point. So here is your simulation of what you would see in a photomission experiment. This is going to be a time result photomission experiment because you need these ultra-fast pulses to see it. So you have the dispersion relation is occupied, so these electronic states are occupied all the way to the chemical potential, which is here, and there is nothing above. However, T equals, equals zero means that you have pump and, and probe coming together. The two pulses are coincident. So you are exciting electrons up here, 0 0.6 electron volt above the chemical potential. If you wait some time, after a characteristic time, tau Q, the electron will have relaxed down along the cone, emitting that particular energy. So can we see it? And the answer, of course, is yes, we can. And what is the advantage of doing something like that? Well. Now you have a relation which is very simple, which is between the electron photon scattering time, the electronic density, and what is called the mode projected electron photon matrix element. Or written in other terms, you can write times the frequency of the mode and the electron photon coupling parameter. So basically, just by following the evolution as a function of time, you can get this quantity, which is otherwise not accessible in any other way. And here is the experiment that Katie has been able to do. You're basically looking at data which correspond to this particular region. Uh, you're looking at a single spectrum as opposed to a mapping, which in principle one could do, but this is a single spectrum. You see the, the raw data are, are shown here. There is a tail of intensity corresponding to electron-electron scattering, so electrons which are relaxing through scattering. Here is a peak which corresponds to the the population we have created, the direct you know, transition populated population we have created with our uh, laser field, the pump, and at a distance, which corresponds to a particular phonon mode of the system, you see a peak that comes up. And that peak, if you follow the full dynamics, which I'm not going to show, does show the delay, a, a specific delay, and allows you to go and calculate, or obtain, a value for the electron phonon matrix element and compare it to a theoretical value 
and showing very good accuracy. So this is the first time that this experiment has ever been done and is a very powerful way of extracting from an experiment with you know extremely limited modeling uh, values for these microscopic parameters. What about superconductivity? Well, there's been a lot of work and we have contributed to this to the field of optically driven superconductivity. Here is work done by Andrea Cavalleri at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, uh, sorry, Hamburg. And here is work that we've done with David, my group, and our collaborators uh, in Vancouver. And the idea is using uh, these techniques, you can learn about the physics, but in a way you can also engineer your materials in a way which is different from engineering, you know, by, by rotating and so on, but you can engineer it through an external field and either enhance or suppress superconductivity and so drive the system in a, in a, in a non-equilibrium state. However, there is one particular experiment I'd like to highlight, which is, has not been done yet, but is now possible thanks to development like the ones that David Jones' uh, group has, has done. And this is the topic of a new CFI project we have submitted and we hope to hear in a couple of weeks and brings together many of us from, uh, from the Institute as well as our collaborators. And the idea is in photo emission, and this really goes back to the first slide I showed. If you're looking at a hydrogen atom in a single particle in the hydrogen atom, a single electron, well, you can see the, you know, uh, the, the quantum nature of that electron in that atom. Uh, and this is basically what, you know, all you can get. But can you actually get to the wave function of a mini-body state? As a mini-body state, I'd like to take the one of, of a superconductor again, so a Cooper pair. So these are the two electrons in a Cooper pair uh, into this mini-body wave function, which are responsible for superconductivity. Now, when you come in with a low-energy photon, photon, you remove one of those electrons and you measure it. However, every time you do that, you're going to collapse the wave function. A, you, you can learn about the energy and momentum of these particular electrons, but you, you lose any, you, any information about the, the many body wave function left behind or that you started from. Now, with the kind of approaches we, I just described, we can come in with a very high energy photon. It's, uh, in fact, a high energy photon uh, with a time structure, so as you can generate with these lasers, and you can detect because the energy is so high simultaneously the two electron that forms a Cooper pair. You can now have two detectors, both of them working in a time regime, so time of flight detectors, and you can measure a coincident experiment uh, where you can now tell whether the two electrons are coming from the same Cooper pair, the same many body wave function or not. And once you do that, by studying the angular distribution of intensity, you can basically uh, reconstruct what was the inner structure of the particular wave function we are interested in. So this is really for, for, for us a dream experiment where you go from you know, the photoionization process that gives you uh, the orbital structure of a single wave function to the one that could give you the orbital structure of a Cooper pair. Well, this sort of... Uh, um, is all I wanted to tell you in terms of the science development, you know, of one particular example. I'd like now to go into discussing what we define grand challenges for the Institute. So in the Institute, the moment we, we really look at, you know, uh, developing this effort going from fundamental to translational, we also look at what are those grand challenges that QMI, with its expertise, can address. And we have so far defined three, which bring us, you know, many of us uh, together into this project, you know. And the first one is that on, of the, the two-dimensional material, similar to what I discussed uh, the, uh, for the, the twisted uh, copper oxide. Another one is really the very heart of the quantum materials by design project, which is that of an atomistic approach uh, to the design of materials, but now looking at the role of disorder. And the third one is a, in, an effort in quantum information. So let me give you a few, uh, you know, just a very brief overview about, uh, about this project. The one I discussed already, I won't say much, but again has to do with fabricating materials, stacking them or growing them layer by layer. The second one is the one about disorder. And I, that's quite interesting because, very interesting, because if you think of, you know, the first experiment I showed on the copper oxide, their superconductor with Doug uh, Walter and, and Rishin Liang, the idea was to really grow perfect crystals so that you could be able to tell at a very low temperature what the uh, nature of this material was. And impurity, of course, can be a problem. 
In the case of silicon, you can, of course, grow extremely pure uh, crystals, but if you do, those crystals are semiconductors, they do not conduct, and so they can are totally useless for uh, any application. And so the game in, in, in semiconductor is to control very finely the amount of impurities you put in, so you can control you know, how conducting they are or not. And, uh, and so here is now, uh, if this is the, the default you introduce in silicon to be able to do the control, uh, here is now the approach where you, you go to really using disorder now, not just a single impurity, but you know, deliberate disorder on the system, which can be of a chemical nature, different colors, structural, different locations, or magnetic. So let's say different magnetic moments into a system and really elicit new physical properties and in particular quantum physical properties using disorder as an approach. In this particular direction, there are many different research projects being uh, explored. One I find very interesting for, for to, and, and with, especially for, for you know, to discuss in the department, <coughs> is the one that brings together also Jess McIver, in addition to QMI members. And that has to do with uh, applications of interest to LIGO. So the idea is to use amorphous materials, so the disorder materials, to improve the mechanical properties of, of coding, which are placed on the mirrors, with the ultimate goal of improving the signal to noise you, know, you could obtain with these particular mirrors reducing, for instance, <coughs> mechanical vibrations and so on, on the coding. And similarly, you know, I, I'm really happy to see that we can come together and, with the department and do work, uh, you know, where we use our expertise for a different kind of application than, than a typical one in, in the quantum materials. Another one which is very interesting is with Jeremy Heil, where uh, we're working on, uh, you know, a project that is led by Jeremy, on the development of uh, with satellites with detectors to measure X-ray emission from black holes, and so work at QMI is um, is on the on the fabrication of the detectors and testing of the detectors. So again, with the infrastructure we have and the expertise we have, we can join forces to tackle you know really large scale and uh, problems and, and, and very deep questions outside of the field of condensed matter. Finally. <coughs> The last grand challenge is the one that has to do with uh, quantum computing. This is the one that is led by uh, Robert Rausendorf, and uh, probably many of you have heard about you know, recent development, and so the reaching of uh, quantum supremacy by the Google team and the Google researchers. We actually had a, a seminar given on this recently uh, by John Martinez. <clears throat> and um, what the quantum information group within QMI is doing is not so much that of, you know, competing with Google on the development of a quantum computer, is really to look at what can be done uh, with a real, you know, realistic uh, system today. So in terms of number of gates, limited, let's say, to 10,000, uh, you know, in qubit, 100 qubit. So what can actually be done if, in this particular parameter space, in terms of computation of problems which are relevant to quantum materials? And so here is a number, you know, uh, solar cells, quantum emitters, so many different problems. And for instance, you know, high temperature superconductivity could be one of them that can be tackled using these kind of approaches. So this particular effort is divided in three pillars. One has to do with machine learning. The other one has to do with building quantum simulators. <coughs> and the last one is with quantum computing theory. Well, um, now coming up to the conclusion of the talk, I'd like to you know, discuss a little bit about what's next. And in, in the context of what's next, we have in the past few years made major investment through people in uh, uh, QMI and physics uh, in the direction of uh, quantum materials by design. And one of the areas which have, has really been expanded is the one of material fabrication. You know, going from the early effort of, uh, of Doug, Walter, and Rishin into many more tools and, uh, and experts that we have now in the Institute. So the first one with the KSO, I briefly alluded to, but this is the technique called molecular beam epitaxy. So the technique that the KSO is, is, is developed and is already using a, in QMI is that one of growing a system now layer by layer. So no longer the stacking I was describing before, where you take a particular layer of material and you stack it on top of something else, but now in, in vacuum, you work in you know, high uh, purity vacuum chambers and you start using different cells evaporating all these elements 
uh, in a particular sequence that you can actually monitor so that you can really grow layer by layer and now form objects that you know you wouldn't be able to form otherwise and where for instance you, you define an interface and where maybe the interface itself is the interesting material and in fact there is a lot of cases of you know uh, properties that live at the interface is it even between two systems or even at the interface of a single material so for instance one of the problems that Kerr is working on is again superconductivity in iron compounds iron selenium and instead of you know taking down the system from being a crystal to being a single layer tc increases by a factor of 10 and so these are the kind of phenomena we can study <clears throat> the other approach is to now go and do crystal growth but not no longer at atmospheric pressure but at actually very high pressure and this is what alana halas is doing as one of the activities in her lab is really pushing the, the range of pressures which are achievable and will build and acquire a system soon that really takes it uh, you know, to uh, extreme values. Here, highlighted in blue, is uh, where most of the materials are being uh, grown these days, and that's where, in gigapascal, Alana and her group will be able to, to push this approach. Finally, with Curtis Berlinger from Chemistry, here we are looking at the uh, effort which is focused on high throughput synthesis. In a way, it's like doing combinatorial approach where now you can go using a, a, a robotic approach to the growth of material. You can go over many uh, different compositions uh, for samples. And so what Curtis is pushing now, in addition to the, to the growth of the material, the fabrication of the material, is also the, the characterization so that you can be basically as fast in the characterization as you are in the growth. And so these three approaches, together with, of course, the bond, is still working in this area. And also Megan Aronson, our dean, who is also uh, working in the area of crystal growth, making you know, five groups who are really uh, pushing the boundaries of what is possible in material science, not only perfecting known crystals, but exploring uh, totally uncharted territories in this direction. With this, I'm coming to the end of the talk. Uh, the last slide is in line with what uh, uh, Janice was asking. What about students? Well, there is a major effort in uh, the training of students in QMI that goes beyond you know, the usual training of graduate students in labs. Uh, we have many activities for, for the graduate students, of course, you know, career development programs, both to take them you know, geared towards the academia, but also towards the private sector. <clears throat> but at the same time, we have many programs for undergraduates. Certainly, co-op is, uh, is uh, one program that brings many students in, uh, in uh, QMI. In fact, we have, uh, as part of our agreement with Max Planck Society, we usually have about 10 co-op students every summer going to Max Planck in different institutes in Germany for a research project there. So, of course, now with uh, the current situation, this is not possible, and I doubt it will be possible next summer. But please keep this in mind if you're interested, because that's something that has been extremely successful and extremely interesting for both the students and the supervisors in the past few years. We also developed new programs for undergraduate, like the one you, sh you see showcased here, Quantum, Quantum Pathways. This is uh, meant to be a, a summer uh, program for underrepresented uh, minorities and uh, it runs, brings students in not only for just one summer period but actually for four consecutive summers uh, starting from the first year of undergraduate all the way to the end. And so in fact we have now about uh, 13 students in this program. Uh, we have run this for a number of years and uh, is, is uh, actually very interesting and, and, uh, and uh, because of its nature has also been showcased in, in the particular issue of physics today which was devoted to careers and, uh, and uh, for junior people especially uh, minorities in, uh, in STEM and uh, so I really would like to invite all of the you know uh, interested undergraduate students to, to come over and discuss with us possible projects that could uh, suit their, their interest. This brings me to the conclusion and uh, hope that you you know, that was able to give a sense of uh, what goes on in QMI. Of course, there is way too much that I can possibly describe in the talk, and, and uh, certainly it would be great to have other opportunities for other members of the Institute to tell you about their science directly, as opposed than hearing from me, and for you, anyone interested, to come and visit us. I'd like to conclude by, you know, by uh, 
thanking a number of people. Certainly, I, I'd like to thank all of the faculty members, the students, the postdocs, and staff in QMI. Uh, we are now about 270 people in the institute, so it's, it's a large number of people who have contributed to, to all the work that we are doing, and some of which you saw today. Obviously, I'd also like to you know, thank the, the deans and, uh, and, uh, and president who, has, uh, who have supported us in all of these years in our growth as an institute, in the joint in, uh, Max Planck UBC Tokyo project, including a joint PhD program that we now have. But also, and more than anyone, I would like to thank all of the members of the physics department. <clears throat> this has been an activity that has gone on now for 10 years, and we would never be where we are today if you did not you know, support us all the way along this, 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 this path. And, uh, you know, we had, Colin has been a, a major player in this. Uh, this, of course, in the case of the hiring of the new faculty members, uh, but not only that, you know, really setting up the, the, the different initiatives in the institute and supporting that. And, of course, all of the members, you know, all, every faculty has contributed, whether through the CIA, through the interview, participating and helping us bring here, you know, the best, uh, young scientists in the field. So with this, I'm really grateful to all of you and uh, thanks for your attention during the talk.